are you? So am I. Did, did you say that for any special reason? Or you just, huh? No, I reason that because I run across so many of my long lost cousins from Memphis. You know, I just. Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I still feel a lot better this week than I did last week when Nixon was out of the country. I mean, that, that scared, that scared, I mean, it hasn't anything to do with Nixon, but any time the president leaves the country, it scares me. Because I just get a sneaky suspicion he might know something. <laughs> so I'll be nervous till they get back. So, and especially now with Nixon the president, and that means every time Nixon leaves the country, Agnew becomes the number one boy in charge. That makes you sleep good at night, don't it? I mean, you know, Agnew just reminds me of the type of cat that would make a crank call to the Russians on the hotline. And so that's the only time Agnew bothers me is when Nixon's gone. Because Agnew bothers a lot of people, but he don't bother me because I kind of dig Agnew myself. You know, I mean that. I believe Agnew's putting everybody on. See, I don't believe it is humanly possible for one man to be born that dumb. You know, if Agnew was as dumb as he wants us to believe he is, he wouldn't be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Agnew's so dumb, I wouldn't be surprised if he hijacked the train. And told the conductor, take me to Memphis. Now, I don't mean to scare you youngsters or upset you, nothing like that, but you do know Agnew went to college, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. He started off just like you. I mean, a lot of people don't like to admit it, but Agnew went to college. That's it. University of Baltimore. Matter of fact, I talked to one of his roommates not too long ago that lives in the dormitory with me, and they tell me Agnew was a dumb cat. They tell me Agnew was so dumb that one night all the guys in the men's dormitory decided to save the panty raid, and they said Agnew was the only cat came back with a jockey strap. A lot of people would like to believe that Agnew is the dumbest institution in this country. Nah, it's pretty stupid, but he is topped in dumbness by the United States Navy. And that really surprised me, you know, that really, that really caught me by surprise. And had I not, you know, really been watching it, I never would have believed it, because I always thought the Navy, being that they didn't get no draft fees, you know, uh, it's pretty hip and pick, you know, certain type of guys. But I really got to find out the Navy this summer when they was, well, I'm sure you read about all the stuff when they were shipping the pars and gas. Was going, and they played it a big in the paper. And, and the Navy said, well, have no fear because, you know, there ain't no big job to scuttle a ship, you know, that's ours. So, and said that, you know, they had the slickest kind of electronic devices. And so I was watching the cat when he was talking, and, you know, everybody was upset over dumping that gas in the ocean, but, you know, I felt better in the ocean than in the ghetto. And I thought it was, you know, it would be as safe as it could with the Navy, with all of its electronic devices, you know. And I said, if I'm looking at television while they're scrubbing that ship, and the Navy admitted they lost the ship. And that scared me. I mean, not only how do you lose a ship that's yours, but how do you lose one that's not trying to get away? I mean, you know, I could halfway understand if it was a Russian sub or something, you know. And so that kind of, you know, really let me know where the Navy was. And, and it kind of uh, made me reevaluate uh, 
my my trend of thought about the United States Army because up until the poison gas incident, I just knew the army was the dumbest thing in the country. But no, the army was you see the army had the job of transporting the poison gas from Alabama to Florida. See, the Navy didn't take over until it got to Florida. And, and so I said, my child, with them dumb cats with the gas, then we might all get wiped out, did it? And so I'm looking at television every day to see how they're going to deal with it. And it was a little army captain. And I thought he handled himself pretty good. Newton says, well, uh, uh, do you think uh, moving this gas through the, through the country uh, uh, can create a, a danger. Many Americans are frightened. And, and he said, well, no, we have made elaborate plans and we've taken all types of safety precautions. And so he said, well, could you tell us what type of safety precautions? And uh, he showed him, he said, we're going to put the gas in these box carts and they're going to be open. And on each box cart, we're going to put a live rabbit. What's the rabbit for? That's the safety valve that we will know if the gas leaks because the rabbit will die. I said, hot damn, that's the army gas. Now, now, I mean, that's clever. Hell, you, you take a whole lot of brain for us to come up with something that clever. I mean, don't you think that's clever? You put the rabbit up there, if the rabbit dies, you know the gas is escaping. See it? Not to mention that you could just watch the engineer. <laughs> but, I mean, that's a cold shot, you know, tell the engineer, we're going to watch you, right? See <laughs> it? And so I think it was more humane, you know, to say, well, uh, feel secure, engineer. If anything happens, the rabbit is split. <laughs> and the engineer never thought that both of them would be making it together, right? And so as I looked at the summer and how everybody, you know, was uptight over the gas and, and how the Army came up with this very ingenious program of using the rabbit, and I realized how much progress we black folks have made in America in the last 10 years. But 10 years ago, baby, we would have had the rabbit job. <laughs> yeah, I can just see them running the ad in the paper today. Wanted 20 Negroes to ride a train from Alabama to Florida. Guaranteed no segregated seating. The job's so easy, even a rabbit could do it. <laughs> Apply soon, it's a gas. So let me say, it is a pleasure to be with you this evening. I guess I can... Uh, I truthfully say that I spent about 98% of my time today on college campuses. And for a reason, and that simple reason is that you young folks in America is probably the most moral, honest, ethical, dedicated, committed group of young people that's ever lived in the history of this country, bar none. And I hope you don't have to continue to read these old right-wing cracker-controlled newspapers to find out who you are or what you're all about. Because you see, the average established newspaper in America is not even morally sound enough to even to discuss you young kids with yourselves. What do they call you in the paper? Hippie, yippie, irresponsible, bearded, smelly kids, whatever that means. My reaction to that's always been because you have a beard, why does that mean you have to think? They don't say nothing about Abraham Lincoln. He didn't only have a beard, he was ugly too. And so I say to you youngsters in America tonight, I hope you understand your importance. I hope you youngsters understand that the very faith and destiny of America depends on you. Are oh, you listening to all these old fools sitting around talking about the problems, 
the difficulty in solving the problem. Everybody gets upset over the problem. You can't nobody solve the problem. If you look, you understand, you got a big job, you young people. Here, regardless of what you hear about problems today in America, all the problems confronting America today was created by man, which means they can be solved overnight. But you have to solve it with moral, honest, ethics, statesmanship ability and not just sick, degenerate political muscle. That's what the problem is. Damn right, ain't no way in the hell you're going to solve the problem of law and order until you start talking about bread and butter. That's simple. Hell, ain't nobody creating crime, violent crime, man, but hungry folks. It's a pattern. Yeah. Hungry a cat is, just put your heels in that pocketbook and bust your head wide open. So, I mean, before we try anything else, let's try feeding them. So I said, you youngsters got a big, big job. Of course, we could lower the crime rate overnight. That ain't no big thing. Just pass a law to say any time the, the crime rate in America increase, the head of the FBI will lose his job. You ain't seen no crime decrease. And who will be on television tomorrow and say, let me explain this strange phenomenon. Crime rate decreased 10 points overnight. You know, I say you youngsters have a big job. If America falls from the inside within the next four to six years, and it's possible. It happens to stronger countries than us. The Greeks, the Egyptians, all these countries at one time were too strong to be destroyed from without, and they went morally bankrupt and crumbled from within. And so I tell you youngsters tonight that if this country falls from the inside in the next four to six years, us so-called good folks, we cannot blame the bad folks. You see, one good thing about the bad people in America is they have been thoroughly bad for 400 years. So they didn't surprise us. We've been knowing where they were. The problem in America today is that the good folks just decided to get good. So you youngsters have a, a big job. As I travel around the country today, I... I hear all the young folks is upset over the repression that's coming down in the country. Huh? And number one discussion in America is over repression. And I say, you youngsters, I hope you, hope you understand repression. And a lot of people want to blame Nixon for repression in America. Don't blame Agnew. Don't blame Attorney General Mitchell. There's a lot of things you can blame them three for. But repression is not one of them. I guess if you really want to put the finger on the cause of the repressive force in America today, I guess you youngsters have to blame yourself. Because what is happening in America today as far as repression is concerned is a reaction to this moral force that you're raising up. So it has nothing to do with Nixon. As the young people in America would have brought the moral issue to the streets five years ago, LBJ would have brought repression down on you. Matter of fact, a lot of you ain't going to want to hear. But as you brought this moral force out in the street, when Jack Kennedy was president, Kennedy would have brought repression down on you. You got to clap on that, too. Yeah, that's the biggest myth of the American history is that Kennedy trick. Especially black folks. I don't know what he did to white folks, but I know he tricked the hell out of niggas. You realize the Kennedy family owns the United Fruit Company? You know what United Fruit Company has put them people through in South America down through the years? Every time you see a banana, you ought to feel like revolting.
Oh, I hear so many people discussing this mission. Let me say them. Where did he come from? You know damn good well where he came from. Damn well where he came from. He's a homegrown boy. I run across people act like Nixon came down here from out of space with some bazookas and said, up against the wall, I'm your president. You know, damn good well how Nixon got in office. Your mom and daddy went to the polls and they put him in office. That's how he got in. The majority of the Americans that went to the polls on election day decided that Nixon should lead us. That should let you know what state this country is and what job you youngsters got ahead of you. But it was bound to happen. Look at American voting records over the last 100 years. It had to happen. Last 100 years, we've been going to poll with a show us of voting for the lesser of the two evil. You damn right, one day you're going to end up with the evil of the evil. <laughs> See, that's the, that's the one advantage to a democracy over a dictatorship. When you get one of them free sins, it's your fault. You can't blame that on nobody. Uh, but people just really just act like, where did he come from? Where did he come from? Damn well where he came from? I meet so many people that don't seem to understand what's going on in the street. So many young folks don't understand what, why this thing is coming down on you. The people in America today are basically reacting to a fear. And what they're scared of is this moral force that you're presenting. Whether you like it or not, it is man's basic right to become afraid. And once he become afraid, it is his basic right to react to those fears, even if his name is Agnew. If I look out here tonight and think I see a ghost, and my reaction to my fear will be to run out of here, and I run out of here with such force, I'll stomp 10 of y'all to death. There's not a court in the world that can put me in jail because it's my basic right once I become afraid to react to my fears. You know, you young kids in America with this moral force that scared the hell out of us sick and slimy and beginning, and we reacting to it. The hard hats in New York City and this repressive force is nothing more than you scared it. The sad thing is, when every nation the size of America becomes so definitely afraid of a moral force, then it might not be nothing left for that nation to do but go down. So I say to you youngsters tonight, America, you got a big job because we're leaving you a hell of a mess. You're going to have to demand, demand a lot of wisdom out of you young folks. The youngsters are going to have to have a coolness and an understanding that no youngster in the history of America have been demanded to have. Hope you understand where this country is today. He got to fly all the way across the Atlantic Ocean so he can embrace and hug the number one fascist degenerate on the face of this earth, Frank Cole. That, that should have let you know where we are. And he was just smiling and waving and just... Man, that Franco act like he had reservations about hugging Nixon. Hope you youngsters understand what's going on. Hope you understand the, the period that you're living in in America today. The youngsters are coming through at a time when the President of the United States will refer to college kids as bums and hoodlums, but he's never said a derogatory word about dope smugglers. Did you say that? Might not seem important, but if Agnew and Nixon 
could bad mouth dope pushers as bad as they bad mouthing young kids. Maybe them damn hard hats in New York City would attack some dope pushers for lunch one day like they jump on pizza. Understand it's the sickness of this nation. And then everybody plays games. You know, Sam good and well, Nixon made that announcement about the, the peace initiative because the election is right around the corner. And if you were silly enough to believe it was for any other reason, you're out of your damn mind. All the ones he wants to talk about. Prisoners of war. Because that's a good political issue. And he can get by with it because he know what stinking, slimy, degenerate fools he's dealing with in this country. But damn it, you ought to tell that priest since he's so concerned about humanity. Why don't the hell he do something about them veterans laying up in them VA hospitals that ain't got enough equipment and enough attention? I'm against all war, and I'm against all soldiers, and I'm against all killing, but damn it, if one of them boys is stupid enough to get caught in that bag and then come back here with both legs gone and both arms go, and then I got to look at a documentary where they eat once every three days because they can't, they haven't got no arms to feed themselves, and the nurse situation is so damn short, they can't get around to feed them in VA hospitals in America, and all these damn faggot ass American Legion is running around holding parades, supposed to be so goddamn patriotic. Why don't you go to the VA hospital? Just as much our fault as it is Nixon and Agnew and these stinking politicians. I look at them soldiers laying up in them VA hospitals the same way I look at drug addicts. They are the victim of a stinking, rotten system that permits it to happen. Now, it's up to us to see to it that they get better care than they get me. But Nixon's so busy worrying about some, some, some prisoners of war. We got thousands of no-legged boys right at Walter Reed Hospital, right under his breath, that's not getting proper attention. But he ain't worried about that, because that's not a good political issue. And if it becomes a good political issue, then Agnew will be at the VA Hospital making a speech in the morning. <laughs> and so I hope you young kids in America tonight understand what's going down. There's so many young kids that don't know why you're being picked upon. Why the government's so hard on you? You know damn good and well why the country's crazy. <laughs> and when people go mad, they always pick on the people they love. You ain't never read or heard where a crazy cat jumped on a cop with a bazooka. He always kill his wife and family when the police show up. He throw his stuff down and start crying. That's how you know he's crazy. And that's where America is today. We love y'all. It's crazy. So I say I hope you youngsters understand. Please understand repression. You see, if you youngsters really understand repression, if you understand repression beyond a shadow of a doubt, then you will find out that repression is more detrimental to the oppressor than it is to the oppressed. It's very important. Repression is more detrimental to the oppressor than it is to the oppressed. Let me briefly explain to you what repression is. Let's all assume that we are all here tonight, we all living in a one-room kitchenette. 
Uh, a lot of white folks don't know what one room kitchen that is, so let me explain that now. If we was all living in a one room kitchenette, that means that, that, that all of us eat in that one room, we sleep in that one room, we go to toilet in that one room, we cook in that, it, it means that we got one room. And you can usually tell it because it's one door. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, I'm right. Sometimes you can draw little pictures of windows on the wall or trick people, you know. You ever go by a cat's house and look out the window at midnight and the sun's up, that's a picture. Now let's say that we all in this one room kitchenette and a couple of the folks decide to come up here and put a tea kettle of water on the stove to heat it up because they want to make some coffee. So they put the tea kettle on. And when the water gets the bubbling good, they are so engrossed in a conversation, they forgot they put the tea kettle on. And so the tea kettle started making a strange sound. Now, Attorney General Mitchell, back on the top bunk, who don't like coffee anyway, he is the noise, and he gets so alienated with it, he sends two marshals up to plug up the hole. And them dumb fools walk up to the stove and plug up the tea kettle. That's repression. Repression is more detrimental to the oppressor than it is to be oppressed. Oh, they're having a the ball now, smoking a big cigar. They don't hear no noise. We got it. Just stand there, three. Just <laughs> stand there a few minutes. You see, nature has certain universal laws. And whenever you violate universal law, you react. And that's what happens. The water is controlled by nature. The fire is controlled by nature. And when you put it on a tea kettle and put it together and it gets the bubbling to a certain extent of heat. But once you let it go past that part, universal law has been violated. But before she blows it, nature's so beautiful, she ain't got no hang up. She ain't negative, she ain't positive, she ain't hot, she ain't cold, she ain't black, she ain't white. She ain't got no hang up at all. So before she blow it, she gives you a warning. That's what the noise was all about. And when you dumb enough to plug up the last warning nature's giving you, you are in trouble. When a woman becomes pregnant, the labor pain. Oh, a lot of people look at labor pains as an alienation. Oh, I can't wish I could have a baby without these damn pains. Labor pains is nothing more but nature's way of saying, Hey, lady, if I was you, I wouldn't go to the movie tonight. we found a way to repress labor pain. So some doctors came up with a pill. No more labor pain. We got the end. We can repress the pain. Oh, be some happy folks. Oh, I got 12 kids I can have with no pain now. And women be just sipping them little pills and taking them and having the ball. Then the conversation would go like this. Well, honey, I just don't understand. I was shopping down a sex with Avenue and the baby just fell out. <laughs> Well, do you know why? I have no idea why. I just don't have no idea. Uh-huh, okay. Young kids is out in the streets tonight in America. 
A lot of people are getting alienated. If we older folks just understood what was happening. And sounds we hear coming from the young folks that look, we looking at coming from the young folks, that's nothing more but nature's way of warning us sick, tired, beginning, insane nation that you better stop violating universal law and make some quick adjustments or she's going to blow it. So in a one-room kitchenette, when the water gets to boiling, and you have enough sense and ethics and decency to go over and relieve the condition that's causing it, then order is restored. The universal law is balanced out. At any time, you get roguish and bogus enough to go over and not deal with the condition that's causing the noise, you want to go over and plug up the tea kettle, and she's going to blow it for you. And when a tea kettle blows in a one-room kitchenette, everybody in that room is going to get burned, including Attorney General Mitchell on the top bunk. So I say, you youngsters tonight, you mind, you got a big job. You can sit by, laugh, and talk about it, and don't want to participate, and wonder what's happening, or be glad when it blows. America is nothing more but a one-room kitchenette, baby. And when she goes, she goes. And when she blows, ain't no such thing as, I'm the good guy, and I'm the bad guy. Or oh, I didn't put the pot on. And so I say to you youngsters, I hope you understand repression. I hope you understand universal order. Oh, I meet so many people running around talking about revolution, baby, revolution, revolution. Well, it's nothing else. Just, un just understand revolution. Just use the naturistic sense you was born with and understand revolution. Because you can't go to no book. Oh, weird Karl Marx messed up revolution by lying, making people think revolution is controlled by man, all them so-called intellects you read Marx. You know, let's do it. Well, run around talking about, let's read revolution in book. You, you read up on a revolution by the same way a woman will read up on having a baby by herself. Understand one thing. You read Karl Marx and you blew in your face. Revolution never will and never have been controlled by man. Revolution always has and always will be controlled by nature. You understand revolution, you will understand that revolution is nothing more but an extension of evolution. And evolution is nothing more but a gradual naturistic change that after long periods of time leads into revolution, which is quick change. When a woman gets pregnant, the first nine months of the gestation period is evolution. When the water bag breaks, that's revolution, baby. If you think you can stop nature's revolution with some National Guardmen, I tell you what you do. You find you a woman that's nine months pregnant. And when her water bag breaks, you get all the National Guardmen on the face of this earth and see if you can cross her legs and keep the baby in her. Universal law say after nine months pregnancy, she's going to drop that baby to mean death to the mother and the child. America's nine months pregnancy is just about up and this baby's going to fall if it means death to the mother and the child. So I tell you young people tonight, you got a big job. You have an important job. A lot of people try to underestimate you young folks' importance. Let me tell you one thing. In 1930, 
had the young German kid came to the street like you doing now and tied that Nazi boy's hand in the middle of the street and forced him to use gas on young Germans and forced him to gun kids down at the University of Berlin, it would have been a different world today because the whole world would have been ready for that sick, slimy, degenerate Hitler. Because as you treat your kids, baby, you will treat everybody. Well, you youngsters never solved the problems in this country, at least you have alerted the world to what this maniac is up to. You come by my house tonight to make a business deal, and when you walk in my house, you find out my five-year-old daughter has killed my wife, and you see me bent over my daughter shooting tear gas on her and stomping her and sticking her with bayonets and shooting her in the back of the head. If you still want to make a deal with me, you better go home and get your heavy stuff, because as I treat my kids, I will treat you at any given moment. You know, you got a big job. We've left you a mess to clean up. America has violated universal law so tremendously. We have dared put property rights ahead of human rights. You cannot violate universal law no more than that. Property rights is controlled by man. Human rights is controlled by nature. Let me give you an example of what happens when you violate human rights with property rights. Let's say I take a tight shoe and put on my foot. Now the tight shoe represents property rights. This is what man made. And the foot represents human rights. That's what nature made. Now, when I put man's tight shoe on nature's foot, see, when I put the tight shoe on, you can tell it, because I be walking all funny. Catch a gym, look, you catch me violating something. That's right, you know it, too, when you do it, man. Then my friend flip up and said, Big, man, they show us some pretty shoes. Shoes look better than your feet. Yeah, man, but I got to come out of them. They said, No, go down to the drugstore and get you some aspirin, man. We press the feeling. Hey, I check out Dr. Phil. He got some stuff there. You won't even see in it, man. So you put property rights ahead of human rights, and you keep that shoe on. And although you might not feel no feeling since you can repress it, one day you're going to take that shoe off, and you're going to look down, and you're going to see a coin. That's another way of letting you know you can violate universal law. The coin is not on there just because it don't like you. Universal law nature says, anything rub against my own, I will get a reaction. That's what the corn's all about. If you continue to wear that tight shoe, that corn will turn into a callus. If you continue to wear that tight shoe, the callus will turn into a bunion. And if you continue to wear that tight shoe, that bunion will wear the shoe out. Never in the history of man has man been able to make a shoe strong enough to wear out nature's foot. You youngsters have a big job. You have to really understand where America started from to understand where America is. And then once you understand that, you'll understand where she's going. And once you understand that, then you understand the job you youngsters have. I think the biggest problem is so many youngsters don't understand America. See so many youngsters complaining about how, how the old folks be picking on you, bad mouthing you, looking at your funny looking hair, making little jokes about the way you dress. Now that's right, that ain't, that ain't special for you though. You think think the old folks is kind of just picking on you because of your hair and picking on you because of the way you dress. If Jesus Christ came back to America tonight with that stringy looking hair and that hippie, funky robe he had on it, run his ass out of America again tonight. And if he would refuse to go, they'd tie him to a peace symbol and roll him off a cliff. 
Well, you know, if these things, these fly Mr. Jimmy's would run twice out the country, what the hell do you think they'd be to you? And then you just, you know, you, ain't no generation yet. You just don't understand us old fools. That's right. And you're bugging us. That's right. And we don't like it. All the ones you youngsters are going to say to us old folks, that morality in America will no longer be a Brooks Brothers suit and a clean shaven face and a haircut once a week. Who the hell you think you are? All the ones you youngsters are going to say that no longer in America will morality come from without but will come from within. You know we ain't going to let that get through. That means we can't buy malls no more. We know what malls are supposed to look like. And it's a Brooks Brothers suit. It ain't got nothing to do with the inside, it's the outside. Take Chicago in 1968, the Democratic Convention, the hippies and the yippies. Who do you think was the most immoral in Chicago in 1968? The hippies and the yippies or the signers when they came to Chicago that year for their convention? Who do you think committed the most adultery and spent the most money on whores and prostitutes in Chicago in 1968? The hippies and the yippies or the signers when they came to Chicago for their convention? We didn't get a plight over the Shriners because the Shriners came in Brooks Brothers' suit. <laughs> when you get through doing all them things, you just don't look like you did it. <laughs> now, I want you youngsters talking about sleeping in the same room overnight in the same bed with your girlfriend. We say, I'll be damned, you get a Brooks Brothers suit on first. <laughs> right. When you get up in the morning, shave. Put your tie on, and when you walk out there, don't be grinning. I hope you youngsters understand us, old folks. Who the hell you think you are anyway? All at once you're going to say to us old fools in America that the symbol of manhood will no longer be alcohol, it'll be reefers. You say, no. No, it will not. The symbol of manhood will be alcohol, damn you. We pay too big a price to make alcohol the symbol. That's right, seven million alcoholics in America. Seven million, we directly affect the lives of 85 million people. That's the price we pay to make alcohol the symbol of manhood. And it will not be pot. Fifty thousand people get wiped out on American highways from automobile accidents in a 12 month period. And 78% of them people that get killed come from drunken driving. Do you realize the price we paid to make alcohol the symbol of man here? That's why we're going to badmouth this, and talk about them reasons, and talk about how it leads to other things. Damn right. We know it. Well, how you know, Pop, you ain't never smoked a joint? How you know what it's going to lead to? We know what it's going to lead to. Because 99% of all of us alcoholic freaks started off on milk first, remember? I say to you youngsters in America tonight, understand where this country is coming from, understand where she started, and then you'll understand where she is. Oh, a lot of people in America got upset over what happened at Kent University. You got to be out of your mind. You know the history of America, that shouldn't have surprised And niggas had nerve enough to act like we was upset over what happened to Jackson, Mississippi. And niggas is just crazy. 
the hell a nigga gonna be upset on white folks shooting in the girls' dormitory in Jackson, Mississippi, when four years before that, them same degenerate, slimy tramps threw dynamite in the church one Sunday morning where black kids were playing. church on Sunday morning, then four years later, I'm surprised that you got into the girl's down my door. And I say, you young know, understand America. And if you understand America, then Kim shouldn't upset you too much. And those of you that don't understand America, check out our history. Check out the founding fathers. You don't, don't check out America's history in the, in the Black Panther, Black Panther newspaper or the Black Movement newspaper. No, check it out in a pure white Gentile American history book. Read about the founding fathers and see who them cats were. That tell you it's in the book. What about a bunch of damn criminals who the king and queen let out of jail and hoped them freaks would have died in the trip and they made it. That's all it was. Don't take my word, read the history. The history speaks for itself. They came to these shores and discovered a country that was already occupied. Now, who was that? Suppose I walk out here tonight and you and your lady sitting in your brand new automobile and I like it so much I decide to discover it. I can go all over the world and tell my friends I discovered an automobile, but you and your friends will know how I got it, and from that day on, we'll know Dick Gregory is the number one hoodlum in peace. Check out the founding father's history. They landed at the Plymouth Rock and shot and murdered their way all the way across to California. How many Kent states had indigenous wiped out up until now? He just called it something else. Yeah, if you understand American history, baby, would nothing too much surprise you. You cats that came over here was in such a weird, degenerate back. You know, if you check the anthropologists and just, just check man's behavior since man has been here on the face of this earth, very seldom man's behavior Changes. It differs a little bit, but man's always had him some type of way to fight. He's always had little petty wars. It just differs of what he used to fight his wars with. So when you check man's pattern of behavior, man don't change that much until you come to the American man. Never before in the history of the world did anybody have a wild woolly west but us. Never before did a cat have a cowboy. But uh, you know, that cat was so sick and degenerate. He said, ah, damn it, I'm a cowboy. Give me two guns right here. I ain't never up against the wall. I'll kill all y'all. <laughs> he sit at home with his wife and kids eating dinner with them two guns. Eat the spinach, you know, I'll blast your damn brain. <laughs> and to this day, America still has a cowboy mentality. Well, check it out on television. The number one show in the land for 15 years has been Matt Dillon. Matt Dillon, symbol of manhood. Right, damn, I'll clean up the town, kill everybody in the town. Me, Matt, I'm Matt. Okay, Matt, what you and Kitty doing, Sam? We hip to you. 15 years, him and Kitty been shacking together on TV. Yeah, on TV. <laughs> that ain't nothing new. Tarzan wasn't mad to Jane, neither. At least Kitty got more sense than Jane. You imagine Jane shacking with a cat in the street. <laughs> with some old boy he didn't find him. Yeah, the cowboy was a weird dude. Yeah. And one day the cowboy decided, in order to be a good cowboy, damn it, we need to get us an engine. <laughs> For physical therapy, the cowboy needed an Indian. The great white father had a big meeting in the big mansion. And we cowboys need us an engine or we'll wipe ourselves out. 
Why are we going to get an engine? Who's going to be the engine? Yeah, I checked one out last night. We got one. We got an engine. And who is it? Are you the engine, boy? You said, engine, what's that? You just run for the hills and take that gun with you. And the red brother became the Indian. Cowboy had a ball. And one day, the red man couldn't take no more of it. He showed up at the mansion, knocked on the door. White father went to the door and said, what do you want, Indian boy? The great white father, we Indians just come to tell you, we're not going to be your Indian no more. Oh, great white father got up tight. Hey, you red-faced, moccasin wearing freak, who the hell you think you're talking to? The white father, call me any name you want to call me. We're not going to be your Indian no more, cowboy. Oh, the cowboy wouldn't be outdone. He looked, he looked the red man in the eye and said, We know why you ain't want to be the Indian no more, because the cowboy's too much man for you. We feel too good. Didn't he say, your manhood has never bothered us. Matter of fact, we watched you when you landed at the Plymouth Rock. We knew what you was up to. You come through the village and rape our women, kill our kids, burn the village down. That didn't bother us too much because we expected that out of you. Our boss says, that didn't bother you. Then how come you don't want to be the engine? We'll tell you what bothers us. We knew you'd rape our women, kill our kids, and burn our village down, but what we didn't know about you, cowboys, after you finished doing that to us, you'd go all over the world and try to convince him that red man was the savage. But we didn't know to what degree. Oh, when the cavalry won, it was always a grand victory. When the Indians won, it was always a grand massacre. White Father, you either you even accuse us of scalping. Great White Father, you know who invented scalping. You got the records of the document that came over here from Europe that offered 16 pounds for Indian man's scalp, 10 pounds for an Indian woman's scalp, and 5 pounds for an Indian kid's scalp. You, great white father, invented scalp, and all we were doing was retaliating. No, we're not going to be your Indian no more. Oh, Cowboy really was upset. All right. Red boy, you don't want to be Indian no more. We're going to put you up on the reservation and wipe you out anyway. And he say, white father, you might put us on the reservation, you might wipe us out. That's not the issue. The issue is, you will never have us as physical therapy again. We will not be the Indian for you, Kyle Bear. So the Indian rolled off. Great white father realized he was in trouble. He needed another Indian. He was getting nervous. Great white father had the big meeting in the big mansion. He said, we got to get us an Indian. I said, we can't get no Indians, man. We went up on the reservation. Red man ain't coming on. I didn't say red man. I said, we got to get us an Indian. He said, who we going to use? I tell that Jew to come here. Come here, Jew boy. Yeah, what you want? You the Indian boy. He said, no, no, I'm the merchant. I said, you the Indian, boy. I said, the Indian, what's that? I said, you just take that gun and run for the hills. And the Jew became a damn good Indian. Well, he's always been smart, clever. Didn't take him long to catch on. He caught on faster than the great white father thought he was going to catch on because the great white father didn't know how smart the Jew was to begin with. And so in nothing flat, the Jew showed up at the mansion. I said, what do you want, Jaime? We just had a meeting at the temple. He said, what about it? 
Because we just decided we're not going to be Indians no more. Okay, you boy. You're not going to be the Indian no more. Okay. We put, we put the red man up on the reservation for telling us that. You're not going to be the Indian. you got to do something for us. What do you want to do? You say, I don't know. All I know is you're not going to be the Indian no more. So then if you're not going to be the Indian, you got to do something for us. What do you want to do? You say, I'll think about it. The great white father said, okay, while you're thinking, we'll be watching you. And to this day, my Jewish brother still been thinking, and the great white father still been watching him. So the cowboy found himself in another situation. Again, he was without an Indian. Another big meeting was held. He had to pick another Indian. And they sit up in the top of the mansion and look down in the valley. They said, we got to get one. Great white father was upset. He'd gone longer than he'd ever gone without an Indian. Three weeks. He was getting bad. He started slapping his wife and cussing his kids. He knew if he didn't get him an Indian quick, it'd be a shootout in the house. He knew how the shootout would come out because he's the only one who got a gun. So that day, out of desperation, they said, we got to get an Indian. He said, who? They get that Irishman. He said, that big, dumb, clawed, hot, foot bastard. He's too dumb to be an Indian. He said, better him than my wife. Come here, Irish boy. The Irish said, yeah, what you want? So you the Indian boy, he said, the, the, the who, the what? So you dumb Irish freak, take that gun and run for the hills. And you know, when you stop and think about it, the Irishman didn't make it too bad of an Indian. He caught on quick, not as quick as the Jew, but he caught on. He didn't come back real soon, but he came back. And he knocked on the door. His great white father, what do you want, Irishman? Hey, we just come to tell you, we're not going to be your Indian no more. Great white father looked the Irishman in the eye. Well, if you're not going to be the Indian, boy, you have to do something for us. What do you want to do? The Irishman said, well, we decided we're not going to be the Indian. If we have to do something for you, uh, we'll be your police. great white father found that very amusing. You, know, you dumb Irish freak, you, I mean, you too dumb to be, you kill yourself. So great white father rushed in the house to, to, to tell the, the big joke to the other white father. So you know that dumb Irishman talking about being the police? And the super white father stood up. He told little white father, sit down, boy. That's the best thing I've heard. Since we've been in America, he said, you got to be putting me on, Rocky. He says, no, I mean that. He said, you mean the dumb Irishman, the police, and you go for that? He said, I told you to shut up, boy. That's the master plot. Why didn't we think of it ourselves? We'll make the Irishman, the police. He's so dumb, we'll make him enforce bad laws that he won't even know it. We'll do what we want to do. Anything we do, we'll tell him it's legal. And anybody that don't like it, we'll tell him they're illegal. And so it came to pass. The Irishman came to police. And the system was working groovy. Everything was falling in place. Great white father just did anything he wanted to do. Who was going to arrest him? And then one day, he got uptight. Needed an Indian. And things were getting bad because Indians were fast running out. So they had the big meeting in the big mansion. And they was nervous and uptight. The trigger finger was itchy. And so we can't let another day go by without getting us an Indian. So who are we going to get? Let's get that Italian. Come here, Wop. Yeah, what for you want with me? They're going to make you the Indian, Wop. The Indian, what's that? 
and you find out, sit that monkey down, throw that organ grinder away. Take that gun, run for the hills. And if you ever want to know how sick and vicious and insane the cowboy was, you should read Sacco and Vanzetti. Matter of fact, if I had my way, I'd make it law that anyone 12 years old in America would be forced to read Sacco and Vanzetti. So you would never underestimate the cowboy. Story of two Italian immigrants that came to this country and landed in Boston, Massachusetts, and couldn't even speak the English language. The cowboy committed, accused him of a crime that the cowboy committed himself. The governor knew they didn't commit the crime. The prosecutor knew they didn't commit the crime. And then two Italian immigrants went to the lecture chair for something they didn't do, but the whole world knew it because there's never in the history of man been such massive demonstrations on a worldwide level as it was for Paco and Van Jackson. He woke up the Italian. Oh, he hurried up and showed up at the mansion. What do you want, Walk? And we just want to let you know we're not going to be the Indian no more. Great white father says you don't want to be the Indian no more. You have to do something for us. He says anything you want us to do for you, great white father, we'll do except be the Indian. Great white father smiled said, okay. You do anything. He said, yes, anything except be the Indian. He said, okay. Italian, we want you to push a little dope for us. He said, what? Said, yes, we want you to push a little dope for us. He said, oh, no, you're trying to get us in trouble. You're trying to get us arrested. Hey, you damn wop, how in the hell can you get arrested when we own the Irish police? They can't arrest nobody unless we tell them to. Well, I don't have to tell you that. You know damn good and well if Mary Jo would have been driving that car and Kennedy's ass stayed in the bottom of the lagoon all night and she talked as stupid the next day as she did, she'd been on her way to the lecture chair tonight. <laughs> the Italian says, no way I can push dope and not get arrested. Boy, we trying to tell you we own the police. And if we want you arrested, you don't have to push dope. We'll get you arrested just because we want you to. The Italian said, well, even if you own the police and, 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 and they wouldn't arrest us, the American people wouldn't permit us to push dope to their kids. They don't you worry about the American people. We're taking care of that. We're making them stone food. The Italian said, cowboy, you're a good cowboy, great white father, you're great, but you cannot make all of American food. He said, yes, we got the master plot. He said, how are you going to do it? He said, it's called education. <laughs> he said, you can't do it with education. Education is good. He said, that's what it is. We're not going to give them education. We're going to make them think we're educating them, but we're going to indoctrinate them. And there's a difference between education and an indoctrination. Great white father said, Italian boy, let me tell you something. We're going to have the mind so messed up in this country that one day, not only will you be able to push dope to anybody you want, but these freaks will be so messed up in their head, they will never question how a nine-year-old kid in New York or Cleveland can find a heroin man, but the FBI can't find him.